I'm Bill Cronin, the President-Elect of the American Historical Association, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you to the 126th General Meeting of the American Historical Association. This evening is one of the great pleasures, not just of the AHA, but of our discipline. It's an opportunity to celebrate all that is creative and good and exciting about the discipline of history by celebrating the work of extraordinary colleagues and all that they've given us through the work that they have done. We'll also ha have the pleasure of hearing Tony Grafton, who's not only one of the great scholars of our discipline, but one of the great teachers and one of the great speakers of our discipline, speak on the topic of the Republic of Letters in the American colonies, Francis Daniel Pastorius makes a notebook in the wilderness. And his address is preceded by this very pleasant task I have of introducing to you the major awardees of the evening. The first award is one that we were originally to have ske been scheduled to give last night rather than tonight, which is why there's a separate brochure on your chairs for it. It's an award that we've been giving for the past decade or so at the American Historical Association, which is named for two past presidents of the American Historical Association who happen to also hold the small distinction of also having been presidents of the United States of America, Theodore Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson. This award, the Roosevelt Wilson Award, honors individuals outside the historical profession who have made a significant contribution to the study, teaching, and public understanding of history. The AHA has long recognized that historical understanding must be shared to be useful to society, and that public figures who embrace the importance of history are vital to the work of all historians, and in fact, all citizens. Academics, educators, and researchers rely on outstanding public-spirited individuals like the one that we are honoring tonight, Chief Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, in order to do their work. In a variety of actor roles over a very long career, Sandra Day O'Connor has championed the cause of a historically aware citizenry as fundamental to the functioning of American democracy. Justice O'Connor is one of those leaders whose work helps to foster and maintain the very conditions under which future generations are able to learn from the past and be active citizens as a result of their knowledge of the past. Since her retirement in 2006, Justice O'Connor has tirelessly promoted public understanding and teaching of history through civics and civics through history especially at the secondary school level. She's consistently placed historical knowledge and understanding at the center of civic competency and argued that the ability of citizens to guide their society thoughtfully into the future depends on actively educating people about their history. Moving to the end of the citation, recognizing that one of the key functions of history in American public life is to reproduce civic values. We are proud tonight to award Sandra Day O'Connor with the Roosevelt Wilson Award for her reminder that history should be a living legacy and ongoing responsibility for all citizens. Justice O'Connor is not able to join us tonight because of family health issues that she has been dealing with for an extended period, but we are very lucky tonight to have in her stead Diane P. Wood, Circuit Judge of the Seventh Circuit of, of, of this part of the country, appointed by President Clinton in 1995 to accept the award in Sandra Day O'Connor's stead. Judge Wood clerked for, Chief, uh, for Judge Irving Goldberg at the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit and Justice Harry Blackmun in the U.S. Supreme Court. After serving as a legal advisor in the State Department, as an associate dean, uh, as, uh, as an associate at Covington and Burling, and as an assistant professor at the Georgetown University Law Center. In 1981, she was appointed to the University of Chicago Law School faculty, where she served as an associate dean from 1989 to 92, and was the first woman at the University of Chicago Law School to be honored with a named chair. Immediately before being joined to jo getting her court appointment, Judge Wood was a Deputy Assistant Attorney General in the Antitrust Division of the U.S. Department of Justice from September 1993 through July 1995, 
where she was responsible for appellate matters, legal policy, and international enforcement. Her areas of scholarly interest include antitrust law, international trade and business, and federal civil procedure, and she has published widely in all of those areas. She continues to teach at the University of Chicago at Law School in addition to her work on the court. And I ask Judge Wood to come forward and accept the award in Sandra Day O'Connor's stead. Well, obviously I'm not Sandra Day O'Connor, but I am greatly honored to be here in her stead. I count her among my friends, and it is a real privilege to be here uh, to say just a few words that she uh, would want me to say here. Now, of course, Justice O'Connor, for you, is not simply one who is advocating and working tirelessly for the teaching of history. Justice O'Connor is history. Uh, she is a, a native Texan, uh, I'm happy to say, as, as a fellow Texan. Uh, but of course, as you know, she was raised in Arizona, uh, and her biography, Lazy Bee, growing up on a cattle ranch in, Arizona, in the American Southwest, uh, chronicles how that affected her life. She wound up at Stanford Law School, but as she has recounted more than once, although she and her future colleague, Chief Justice Rehnquist, graduated at the top of their class, unlike him, she was not able to find gainful employment upon her graduation. One firm was willing to hire her as a legal secretary. But what she did was she persevered, and I think this was where the seeds of her great interest in public values, public education was born. She found a position as a deputy attorney for California's San Mateo County. Shortly thereafter, she returned to Arizona and began her own extraordinary career of public service, which culminated in her appointment as the first woman to serve on the United States Supreme Court. We don't have time, of course, to look at her decisions at the court, but one theme that would be very compatible with your own work is that of history. She was always conscious, and you have some allusions to that in the brochure that you have, but I can add a few more. A case called Shad Against Arizona. She notes the importance of history, as providing concrete indicators of the requirements of fundamental fairness. In her opinion, in Planned Parenthood against Casey, very difficult opinion dealing with abortion rights, feelings run strong in many directions. She reflected on the tension between the antiquated view of women that had once dominated history and culture and the basic right of a woman to shape her own destiny on, be, on the basis of, of her own beliefs. Since Retiring, and I use the word very loosely because actually the word retirement does not conjure up anything like what Justice O'Connor has been doing. She has devoted herself to the teaching of history and civics. She puts it this way, she says, knowledge of our system of government is not handed down through the gene pool. It must be learned by each new generation. Our public schools were founded to educate children to become citizens. We must not forget that fundamental purpose. And she has done everything she can through particularly her website, iCivics, of which she is very proud. And if you happen to see her, she will be glad to talk to you about it. Um, it's a web-based education project. There are some states, she mentioned to me that Florida has actually enacted legislation that requires this to be part of the um, education of young people there. And it uses modern tools. It uses games for students. It uses uh, other things, games like Do I Have a Right, where the students run a constitutional law firm and they're tested on their knowledge of the Bill of Rights. A game called Executive Command, where students become the president. A game called Immigration Nation, where students learn about that aspect of our history. So you should take a look at iCivics, and you will see 
the creative, energetic efforts of a woman who is a leader in every way in this field. Uh, throughout her career, Justice O'Connor has been a champion of the important role of history in jurisprudence and in public culture. And she is honored, and I am honored on her behalf to accept this award for her. So moving on now to the other prizes that are to be announced this evening, the association is awarding 20 book prizes tonight, recognizing distinction in historical writing for the year 2011. There are many ways that our colleagues can acknowledge the value and significance of scholarly work, but none seems more conclusive or gratifying than being chosen for a major book prize, given the centrality of the book-length monograph as a core intellectual contribution in our disciplines. Our thanks to the many colleagues who participated on the committees that made the very difficult choices involved in identifying the award winners for tonight. It is both a rewarding and a very time-consuming task to do that labor, so we're grateful for everybody who was involved in making the selections. And please notice that in the booklet that's on all of your chairs, you're getting the complete citations for all of the books. In the interest of time, I will not read those full citations tonight, but please do read them yourself to get a sense of just how remarkable the intellectual contributions, not just of the book prize winners, but of everyone else who's receiving an award will be. Begin with the Herbert Baxter Adams Prize, which is given annually for a distinguished book in the field of European history. And this year, books from 1815 to the present were eligible. The winner is Anna Krylova, Duke University for Soviet Women in Combat, A History of Violence on the Eastern Front, published by Cambridge University Press. The George Lewis Beer Prize is offered annually for the best book on European international history since 1895. And tonight there are two honorees for the 2011 prize. They are Davis Charlo, University of Colorado Boulder for Advertising Empire, Race and Visual Culture in Imperial Germany, published by Harvard University Press, and Michael A. Reynolds of Princeton University for Shattering Empires, The Clash and Collapse of the Ottoman and Russian Empires, 1908 to 1918, published by Cambridge University Press. The Albert J. Beveridge Award. This award is offered annually for a distinguished book on the history of the United States, Latin America, or Canada from 1492 to the present. And this year, the winner is Daniel Okrat for Last Call, The Rise and Fall of Prohibition, published by Scribner. James Henry Breasted Prize is offered annually for an outstanding book in any field of history prior to 1000 AD. The winner this year is Saskia T. Roslar, University of Nottingham, for Public Land in the Roman Republic, a social and economic history of Agar Publicus in Italy, 396 to 89 BC, Oxford Studies in Roman Society and Law, published by Oxford University Press, and is with a number of the awardees who would have had to cross an ocean to get to us. Uh, Professor Roslar will not be with us tonight to accept the award. The John H. Dunning Prize is offered for the best book in United States history. And this year's winner is Darren Dochuk of Purdue University for From Bible Belt to Sun Belt, Plain Folk Religion, Grassroots Politics, and the Rise of Evangelical Conservatism, published by W.W. W. Norton.
The John King Fairbank Prize in East Asian History is offered annually for an outstanding book in the history of China proper, Vietnam, Chinese Central Asia, Mongolia, Manchuria, Korea, or Japan since the year 1800. The winner this year is Carol Benedict, Georgetown University, for Golden Silk Smoke, A History of Tobacco in China, 1550 to 2010, published by the University of California Press. The Morris D. Forkosh Prize is offered annually for the best book in the fields of British, British Imperial, or British Commonwealth history since 1485. And the winner this year is Philip J. Stern, Duke University, for The Company State, Corporate Sovereignty, and early, The Early Modern Foundation of the British Empire in India, published by Oxford University Press. The Leo Gershoy Award, awarded annually for the most outstanding work published in English on any aspect in the fields of 17th and 18th century Western European history. This year's winner is Alexandra Walsham, Trinity College, University of Cambridge, for the Reformation of the Landscape, Religion, Identity, and Memory in Early Modern Britain and Ireland, published by Oxford University Press and Professor Walsham who would have had to cross an ocean, is not here with us either. The Clarence Herring Prize, awarded every five years for the best work by a Latin American scholar in Latin American history. And the winner this year is, and I don't speak Portuguese, I apologize, Walter Frafilo, the Universita Federal de Bahia, for Encruciladas de Liberdade, Historias de Escravos y Libertos na Bahia, 1870 to 1910, published by Editore Unicamp, and Professor Filo is unable to join us tonight either. <laughs> the J. Franklin Jameson Prize, awarded every five years for outstanding achievement in the editing of historical sources. The winners this year are Pamela O. Long, David McGee, and Alan M. Stahl for the Book of Michael of Rhodes, a 15th century maritime manuscript, three volumes, published by MIT Press. The Joan Kelly Memorial Prize in Women's History is offered annually for the book in women's history and or feminist theory that best reflects the high intellectual and scholarly ideals exemplified by the life and work of Joan Kelly. The winner is Leslie J. Reagan, University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign for Dangerous Pregnancies, Mothers, Disabilities, and Abortion in Modern America, published by the University of California Press. The Martin A. Klein Prize in African History is awarded for the second time this evening to recognize the most distinguished work of scholarship on African history published in English during the previous calendar year. The prize is named for Martin A. Klein, currently professor of history at the University of Toronto. Funding for the prize was completed thanks to a substantial donation from Dr. Mugo Niaga of California State University at Fullerton and his wife, Dr. Lynette Niaga. The winner is Jonathan Glassman, Northwestern University, for War of Words, War of Stones, Racial Thought and Violence in Colonial Zanzibar, published by Indiana University Press. And I should ask the prize winners to stay long enough to get their applause at the, at the podium, so they're not behind the screen when they're getting it. <laughs> The Waldo G. Leland Prize is offered every five years for an outstanding reference tool in the field of history. And the winner this year is the New Cambridge History of Islam, six volumes, published
published by Cambridge University Press, and Michael Cook of Princeton University, general editor, will accept the prize. The Littleton Griswold Prize is offered annually for the best book in any subject on the history of American law and society. This year's winner is Pauline Meyer of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology for Ratification, The People Debate the Constitution, 1787 to 1788, published by Simon & Schuster, and Professor Meyer is not able to join us tonight. The J. Russell Major Prize is awarded annually for the best work in English on any aspect of French history. And this year's winner is Jeremy D. Popkin of the University of Kentucky for You Are All Free, The Haitian Revolution and the Abolition of Slavery, published by Cambridge University Press. The Helen and Howard R. Moraro Prize is given annually for the best book or article on any epoch on Italian cultural history or Italian-American relations. This year's winner is Michael R. Ebner, Syracuse University, for Ordinary Violence in Mussolini's Italy, published by Cambridge University Press. The George L. Mossy Prize is awarded annually for an outstanding major work of extraordinary scholarly distinction and originality in the intellectual and cultural history of Europe since the Renaissance. And the winner is James H. Johnson of Boston University for Venice Incognito, Masks in the Serene Republic, published by the University of California Press. The James A. Raleigh Prize in Atlantic History is awarded annually for outstanding historical writing that explores the aspects of integration of Atlantic worlds before the 20th century. We have two honorees or sets of honorees tonight. David Eltis of Emory University and David Richardson of the University of Hull for their Atlas of the Transatlantic Slave Trade, published by Yale University Press. Neither of them are able to join us tonight. And who is able to join us tonight, James H. Sweet, my colleague at the University of Wisconsin-Madison for Domingos Alvarez, African Healing and the Intellectual History of the Atlantic World, published by the University of North Carolina Press. The John F. Richards Prize in South Asian History recognizes the most distinguished work of scholarship on South Asia, Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Bhutan, Burma, India, the Maldives, Nepal, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka. Farina Mir of the University of Michigan for the social space of language, vernacular culture in British colonial Punjab, published by the University of California Press, and Professor Mir is not able to join us tonight. And the last of our book prizes, the Wesley Logan Prize, is awarded annually for an outstanding book on some aspect of the history of the dispersion, settlement, and adjustment, and the return of peoples originally from Africa. It's jointly sponsored by the AHA and the Association for the Study of Amer African American Life and History. This year's winner is Frank Andre Greedy. University of Texas at Austin for forging diaspora, Afro-Cuban and African Americans in a world of empire and Jim Crow, published by the University of North Carolina Press. If you're following along in the citation book, I'm now going to skip over the two very distinguished awards that are in the middle of the booklet, and I will do them at the end. I'm going to move now to the 
non-book prizes, which are for contributions every bit as important to the discipline of history as anything we've celebrated thus far, the teaching awards, the service awards, the lifetime achievement awards, all the other ways of doing history that are central to the practice of our discipline. The Eugene Asher Distinguished Teaching Award was established in 1986 to honor excellence in history teaching. It's a joint prize of the AHA and the Society for History Education and is named for the late Eugene Asher, for decades a central figure in efforts to improve the quality of history teaching. Individuals are invited to nominate teachers who by inspirational impact and excellence encouraged that individual to study history. Kathleen Niels Conzen, Thomas E. Donnelly Professor of American History and the College at the University of Chicago is the recipient of this year's Asher's Distinguished Teaching Award. The Beveridge Family Teaching Prize, the second of the prizes tonight that come to the AHA through the generosity of the Beveridge Family, we award the 16th Beveridge Family Teaching Prize tonight, established in 1995. It joins the Beveridge Book Award and the Beveridge Research Grants as a further demonstration of the Beveridge Family's longstanding commitment to the American Historical Association. It recognizes individual excellence in teaching, as well as innovative initiatives applicable to the entire field. It's offered on rotation between an individual teacher and a group of teachers. And the 2011 prize honors two teachers, Marnie Murphy of Three Rivers Middle School in Cleves, Ohio, and Jason E. Yaman of the Blythewood Middle School in South Carolina. The Raymond J. Cunningham Prize for the best article by an undergraduate. Awarded for the second time tonight, the Cunningham Prize honors the best article written by an undergraduate student published in a history department journal. The annual prize was established in memory of Raymond J. Cunningham, Associate Professor of History at Fordham University. Each history department may nominate one article, and the winning author and the winning journal both receive awards. The second honoree is Daniel Williford, graduate of Rhodes College, for his article, Visions of Pre-Islamic Algeria in the Revue Africaine, 1870 to 1896, published in the spring 2011 issue of the Rhodes Historical Review. Also honored here is Eddie Tarem for the Department of History at Rhodes College for the journal that published that prize. So, you, that happened more quickly than it should have. You, do you have a second award for her? Why don't you come up and get the award? The department should share in this honor. So. The AHA Equity Awards were established to recognize and publicize individuals and institutions that have achieved excellence in recruiting and retaining underrepresented racial and ethnic groups into the historical profession and to recognize new initiatives or for sustained efforts. Awarded for the second time in 2011, they are conferred annually, one for individuals, another for academic units, such as departments of history, public history programs, and interdisciplinary programs and research institutes. The Individual Equity Award, there are two, remember, let me read them both. The Individual Equity Award goes to Andres Tijerina of Austin Community College, and the Institutional Award is presented to the History Department at the University of Arizona. Accepting the award on behalf of the department is Department Head Kevin Gostner and Associate Professor Martha Few. We'll do these in two sets of handshakes. The Herbert Feiss Award for Distinguished Contributions to Public History. 
offered annually to recognize distinguished contributions to public history during the previous 10 years. Starting in 2006, the prize's focus was expanded from a book prize to include other types of public history work. The prize can be awarded for accumulative years of contribution in the field or for a singular contribution of major significance. The 2011 prize is awarded to Alfred Goldberg, former director of the historical office of the Office of the Secretary of Defense. William Gilbert Award for the best article on teaching history. The biennial Gilbert Award recognizes outstanding contributions to the teaching of history through the publication of journal and serial articles. The winner of the 2011 Gilbert Award is Stephen H. Corey of Worcester State College for Pedagogy and Place, Merging Urban and Environmental History with Active Learning in the January 2010 issue of the Journal of Urban History. The John E. O'Connor Film Award. In recognition of his exceptional role as a pioneer in both teaching and research regarding film and history, the American Historical Association established this award in honor of John E. O'Connor of the New Jersey Institute of Technology. The award recognizes outstanding interpretations of history through the medium of film or video. And the 17th O'Connor Award is presented to the Pruitt Ego Myth an urban history directed by Chad Friedrichs and produced by Chad Friedrichs, Jaime Friedrichs, Paul Feller, and Brian Woodman, accepting the award as Chad Friedrichs. <laughs> the Nancy Lyman Roll Corps Mentorship Award. In recognition of Nancy Lyman Rolker's role as a teacher, scholar, and committed member of the historical profession, friends, colleagues, and former students established the Rolker Mentorship Award. It's awarded on rotation among pre-collegiate, undergraduate, and graduate teachers and mentors. Nominations for the 2011 prize were for graduate mentors. And I'm pleased to announce that the 18th Roll Corp Mentorship Award is presented to Elizabeth, Elizabeth Blackmar of Columbia University. <laughs> the Roy Rosenzweig Prize for Innovation in Digital History. The Rosenzweig Prize is sponsored by the AHA and the Center for History and New Media at George Mason University. It's awarded annually to honor and support work on innovative and freely available new media projects. I'm sorry, I misread that. Um, freely available new media projects, and in particular for work that reflects thoughtful, critical, and rigorous engagement with technology and the practice of history. The third Rosenzweig Prize is awarded to New York Public Library's What's on the Menu, Accepting the prize is Rebecca Fetterman, the project curator, who is the library's culinary collections librarian and electronic resources coordinator. Each year, the AHA names a foreign scholar as an honorary member of the association, selecting a distinguished historian who has notably aided the work of American historians. The 2011 honorary foreign member is Michelle Sobel of the University of Haifa.
finally, two very distinguished awards that are essentially for lifetime achievement, lifetime contributions before we turn to Tony Grafton's presidential address. The Council of the American Historical Association established the Awards for Scholarly Distinction in 1984 to recognize senior historians of the highest distinction in the profession who've spent the bulk of their professional careers in the United States. The AHA Council itself selects the recipients, the honorees, for this prize. Previous awards have gone to 66 distinguished historians, and you'll find them listed in the general meeting booklet. Joining this distinguished list tonight is Donald R. Kelly the James Westfall Thompson Professor Emeritus of History at Rutgers University, New Brunswick. In his long and exceptionally distinguished career, Donald Kelly has made contributions to several closely related areas of great historical breadth and significance. He's an intellectual historian whose work, both in his own research and writing and in his editorial capacity, has done much to support and exemplify the significance of intellectual history as a field of study. During his 20-year tenure as editor of the Journal of the History of Ideas, the periodical provided an influential focus and home for intellectual historians. He's a leading authority in his own area of research, which is the history of history writing and the history of historiography. For his many contributions to the profession, the association is honored tonight to present this award to Professor Donald Kelly. And Professor Kelly will be one of our additional speakers tonight. Uh, thanks for this award. I have many people to thank along the way. Uh, I should start with Bonnie, of course, but I'll, in the place of that, I'll mention four colleagues who have recently left us. Joe Levine, Perez Zagarin, John Salmon, and Ralph Giese. Uh, Otherwise, I feel something like a dinosaur in the culture of books that Tony and I share. Uh, that is, uh, despite the huge number and the quantity and uh, the number of book exhibits, I think there is a, a decline in book culture and uh, I feel surrounded by e-information and e-communication. Uh, but I suppose that's, uh, uh, that's history too. Thank you. And finally, the last of the evening's prizes, the Troyer Steele Anderson Prize, was established in 1963 through a bequest by a longtime AHA member, Frank Malloy Anderson. The prize is awarded for outstanding contributions to the advancement of the purposes of the American Historical Association, and it has been conferred only nine times in the history of the AHA. The AHA Council selects the recipient based upon a recommendation from the AHA Professional Division, which serves as a nominating jury in consultation with other AHA divisions and committees and the AHA membership. The 2011 prize is awarded to James J. Billington, the Librarian of Congress, and, Professor, and, and Mr. Billington will also address us this evening. Don't worry, as Henry VIII said to his fifth wife, I won't keep you long. <laughs> but I do want to thank the association, both institutionally, because I know through me they're honoring the Library of Congress and the cordial relationship that has existed for many years between the Library of Congress and the association, and more broadly, the historical profession. Um, 
I also want to thank them for, as an individual because history has been my preoccupation in two radically different ways in the two periods of my life, each of which covered more than three decades. First was as a student and teacher and sometimes writer of books about history, uh, largely in three universities. The second as the chief executive officer of three national public programs based in Washington, the most important of which is what has occupied me for the last quarter century as head of the Library of Congress. And I thought the most useful thing I could do for this distinguished group of historians uh, was to mention another list of three. That way you can make sure I don't run on for the statutory 50 minutes former professors. Um, the three things are, I think, the things that would be most interesting to the historical profession. Uh, among the, re and they are all recent innovations in what is our oldest federal cultural institution. And I think a little bit of a vindication that public institutions are capable of innovating, as well as the distinguished universities and other communities that are being honored tonight. First of all, Teaching with Primary Sources program is a very large program that has 10 states, the congressional delegation of 10 states have programs for training teachers in it. They are using our American memory online material, free material, all primary documents of American history, one of a kind, history and culture. Um, 17 million of these are online along with the uh, proven classroom techniques used by people. In our testing we find very young people into the second and third grade. People are being so bombarded with things, audiovisual images, all kinds of things, that they are much more receptive to using this material. And what we've found is that um, this is an extraordinary way of empowering teachers, not telling them how to teach history, but giving them the primary documents. Each one has curatorial, dependable, accurate curatorial comment written in plain English with no jargon. But it's, all, it's quite accurate, as accurate as a historical profession can be. And it has had a very interesting effect, I think, that um, I'd like to linger on for just a minute. Because what happens is that it motivates kids, disproportionately kids that aren't learning at all. Because when they see primary documents, when they see the, the text of Jefferson's Declaration of Independence and see and can play with it on their computers and see the changes that Adams and Franklin, a pretty good editorial team, made. Uh, and then the two paragraphs which discuss slavery that were eliminated um, in order to get it um, uh, through full application, uh, full approval of the delegations. When they see the two variant uh, Gettysburg addresses, when they see the only movies we have th through, through the immense copyright deposit of which we're the unique recipients, you are all, as taxpayers, the recipients, giving them back free, giving, it motivates kids to ask questions. So they get a sort of mature patriotism because they see the human side of history. These are the human documents of the 23 presidents whose papers we have. Uh, they are the earliest movies ever made, the only movies we have of what America looked like and acted like in the 19th century. All of this is online, it's all free, but it's, it empowers the teachers and it motivates kids because they ask questions. And, and once you're asking questions, you're into the learning process rather than memorizing somebody else's answer. <laughs> you're into the creative process. So we think that is a very important uh, and promising initiative, which as I say, has gotten a lot of congressional recognition. 10 states have set up programs to train teachers in the educational uh, uh, use of primary sources as a teaching device, as a way of motivating kids. Now, um, I have to say that this is, um, extremely um, uh, interesting and important because it deals with K through 12 and it deals actually in very early years with what we found. Even in elementary school, uh, this can have a, a dynamic effect. And K through 12 education is our great crisis area and our great 
area in which history it does not, is not made sufficiently to engage. There are a lot of important programs, but this is a, a, a big one. Now, a second thing is, uh, which is probably more directly relevant to the members of this association, but it's perhaps uh, not as widely known, is the expanded possibilities for research at the Library of Congress as a place. Not just the 21 reading rooms, which we've already always had, that are obviously open to the public, but our new Kluge Center is a large facility, a whole wing of the library has been added, so there's much, a lot of room. Uh, we have eight um, senior chairs that are, these, this operates 12 months a year, you know, not on a fixed schedule, but very distinguished senior figures. We had Havel here twice, we had uh, Cardoza, the president of Brazil, we had all kinds of people who have interesting and important things to say and don't otherwise spend much time in Washington. Um, but it's also, and this is the main emphasis, for the very young, for people finishing doctorates or postdoc, and it gives them an opportunity, and, and we stress uh, in weighing these uh, these applications for open competition, uh, interdepartmental work, multilingual, multimedial, uh, multinational uh, projects that will make full use of the immense range of the world's largest collection of maps, music, movies, uh, all kinds of things. In addition, uh, of course, to books. Uh, <laughs> Finally, uh, in this category of expanded possibilities, I would mention something that's quite new, but we have just, about a month ago, finally received enough, raised enough private money so that we will now be able to create an inexpensive, convenient, and congenial place for young scholars to come to Washington at, a, at about one seventh or eighth of what a hotel would cost um, to use the Library of Congress. And that will accommodate, we estimate, about 2,500 a year. So young teachers, working young scholars, uh, people for these young uh, fellowships uh, will have an opportunity. And finally, um, the last thing I want to mention is we are encouraging, I think, not by conscious design, but by a series of things that have happened at the library recently, um, a new emphasis on cultural history in the full anthropological sense of that word. Um, now, I was into this myself a bit in Russian history, and, I, um, and, and this is not just uh, the history of cultural artifacts and things of that kind, which is important in itself. Um, for instance, in my Face of Russia, which was both a PBS series and a book, I actually wrote Russian history in terms of Russia's contact with four, with five, sorry, successive art forms. This was not a history of art, uh, even in Russia, there was a history of how the shape and w nature of, uh, of Russian history in different periods was formed by the sudden introduction from different places of different art forms. I think this is a kind of possible history, but what is really has been my time at the Library of Congress has done for me was to in just encounter, I'm by no means a specialist, but to encounter me overwhelmed by the richness of American culture and its tremendous neglect. We will put online more and more of the cultural legacy of America, but we're, we're doing two projects this year that will come out by the end of the year. One is the history of America seen through popular song, both performed, explained, and analyzed, and poetry, because we have the Gershwin Prize in popular song, we have the Poet Laureate Ship, we're going to convert these into learning about American history, not just about the history of poetry and so forth. And finally, on that regard, I just have to mention the Packard Center for Audiovisual Conservation. This brings together for the first time and conserves through a whole bunch of chemical and other techniques the entire or the closest thing we have to a mint record of American private sector creativity. Because of the immensity of copyright deposit, the movies, the television, the radio, the recorded sound will all be there for further incorporation into the study of, and particularly of American, American history. Um, I could talk a lot about this. I think one of the most interesting frontiers will be for the first time we will be able to transcribe 
the 20, or the 10, I'm sorry, the 10,000 wax cylinders that are the basic recordings that the library made of the history, religion, anthropology, folklore of the American Indians. Th that has been entirely, almost entirely inaccessible. Now there's some of these wax cylinders around elsewhere, but the bar by far the largest concentration beginning in 1890 was accumulated in the Library of Congress. You don't, can't play it, but we now have a machine was developed by the Livermore Labs, which will microphotograph the ridges and reproduce the sound with astonishing fidelity. And so we will have access to that. That's one of the many things here. Now, last comment. Sorry, I'm, I know I'm a little over, over time, but I did want to say that you say, is this the end of the book, or are you forgetting about the book? The United Nations has proclaimed this year the year of the book. We expanded our book festival last year, to two, the National Book Festival, to two days. Um, we got 200,000 people actively participating. Um, we will be doing major conferences uh, on the book uh, and on the history of libraries. Um, we are uh, conscious of the fact. Henry Steele Commons is a great historian, I know, a great pillar of this profession and this association. In his last visit to the Library of Congress, looked out kind of reflectively and said, I, he didn't say it to me, I just overheard it. He said, you know, he said, the United States is the only world civilization whose entire institutional structure was created and has been sustained in, in the age of print. We are not going to lose the values of the book culture, nor do we destroy anything printed when we digitize it. Uh, we are a situation where both in terms of immigration of people, immigration of ideas, everything else, we add without subtracting. And so if this is a superimposition. One technology never entirely replaces another. We're adding, not subtracting. Uh, and the presence of your presidential speech one of the great historians of the book. Um, I just wanted to add that little PS to assure you. Uh, basically, the vision, uh, I think, um, that we have is one that the memory of this country, and the, uh, oh, and the last thing I wanted to mention, I guess I didn't mention before, is the World Digital Library. Sorry if I'm sounding like I'm making a lot of institutional plugs, but that one is simply extending to other cultures. Um, and that is a UNESCO project. It is having a great impact. It's available in seven languages. Um, if we can sustain it, um, it is already having, putting online something from every country in the United Nations. It's in, as I say, in seven languages, and we hope it will play a role in fostering the study of foreign cultures, once again, providing primary documents of very high quality, again, with with curatorial explanations in seven languages. All of this, by the way, and the aging of our workforce, uh, of which I'm in an eminent display, number one, I suppose, um, is uh, promises that there are going to be a great many job openings for, and that we will need scholars with great specialties who at the same time can become nav knowledge navigators of the new and proliferating things that are available on the web. So thank you for honoring not just so much me, but all the hard workers at the Library of Congress and in the library and scholarly community who are keeping our memory alive making it available in the media of a mem in an essentially memoryless media that is will not overwhelm us, but if we do it right, as America always has, we'll be able to add without subtracting, without losing the values uh, of the book culture. Uh, I, I end up, my, my little sermonette, I suppose it's becoming, but I end up with a, one of my favorite quotes from the founder of Hasidic Judaism. Uh, it's a very familiar quote. But he says, you know, exile is caused by forgetfulness, and the beginning of redemption is memory. So thank all of you for your contributions to keeping memory alive uh, in an often present-minded and uh, civilization. And uh, thank you very much for not only honoring me, but the hard workers at the Library of Congress and many other public institutions who are contributing to all these enterprises. Thank you.
Oh. 